um, if the, the deliberations on the provisions of the domestic abuse bill and formal clause by clause consideration will be recorded uh, by Hansard in accordance with normal protocol if members are content. Um, now is the time to declare any interests, financial or otherwise. And apologies. Christine, I know Gordon Dunn is running late um, and will be with us shortly. Doug. Likewise, Doug Beattie. I think that's everybody. Any delegation of votes? Uh, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to you as chairperson until such times as he joins the meeting. Okay. Item 3, draft minutes of the meetings held on the 21st of September and the 24th of September. If members are content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings uh, held on the 21st of September, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and then there's the draft minutes of the 24th of September, and if members are content, uh, again, that that's a true reflection of the meeting, if members are content, then I'll sign accordingly. Agreed. Matters arising, um, just two items. There's a copy of the committee letter to the Minister for Justice requesting that she make an urgent oral statement in the Assembly um, last Monday regarding the legislative error resulting in convictions of 15 individuals for certain sexual offences prosecuted between 2009 and 2017. The response to that is in your meeting pack and obviously then members, the oral statement was made on uh, Monday. Um, in respect of trying to, to pursue that issue further, members, um, I know we, we discussed what more we can do once we had the, the oral statement and members made reference to that uh, as well. Uh, I was going to suggest to members that we would write to the Minister indicating um, uh, that we're not in a position to feel that she's doing enough by way of this lawyer to carry out an assessment of factors and lessons to be learned, that there needs to be greater independence in respect of that uh, and would want her to put forward options. I suggested in the, in the floor of the Assembly um, that consideration should be given to the Criminal Justice Inspectorate being asked to come in to investigate. Um, I'm not saying that that is the body that should do it. But I would be of the view that the Minister needs to do more than what she has outlined in her statement and that we should write to her indicating as such and that we would be happy to engage with her department to identify appropriate terms of references for such an investigation. Are members content, Paul? Yeah, I would agree with your, uh, your route map there, Chair, but can I add another aspect to this which has really alarmed me? with regards to the Minister's statement, notwithstanding the serious matter and issue at hand. But I, it's process and procedure for me. So I can't, for the life of me, understand why a departmental official at any grade would have the power or could have the power to make a deliberate decision to not tell a Minister. So if the department have had conversations since 19, sorry, 2019, and then on February 2020, the PPES informed the department uh, that the further work done had both clarified that there was a definite problem and identified the cases affected. And an official, a civil servant, had made a deliberate decision not to inform the Minister for three whole months. Now, to me, that has just set all sorts of alarm bells ringing, notwithstanding the issue. How many other issues are floating about every single department in this place? So for me, it's a fundamental issue around process and procedure. And who makes a decision like that? Who in the civil service makes a decision like that to actually withhold or not tell the Minister of a very serious aspect and issue within her remit. It's mind-boggling in my eyes. So on that specific point, notwithstanding the issue at hand, well, on the actual process, I think we need I think I need answers, and I'm sure the committees of the CML around no, I'm not talking about individuals, I'm not talking about who made the decision not to tell the minister. What process is in place that allows any civil servant to make a decision like that, to not tell 
not tell. Um, now, remember, one of the biggest problems for a committee is not knowing, unknowing the unknown. But if we're at a point now a minister doesn't know a massive issue in our own department, that's, that's fantastical. It really is scary. So I think we need to find out more about the process of how that could be allowed and the, the information flow can be stopped at any given point. And also what begs the question, what other issues are out there that the Minister has not yet seen? I'll leave there. Linda and Sinead then. Not Sinead in first. Yeah, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I have no objection um, to the letter going, but I just, I suppose in the interest of transparency, want to make it known at committee that I have written to the Minister in that regard, um, regarding some of the answers that she provided following the statement and her subsequent um, and swift action to, uh, I suppose, to fix the record in one of the answers, which to my mind only leaded to further confusion. So I have written seeking clarity on that. I share some of Paul's concern around the, the delay in, in this information being given to the minister. I, my question probably is more more around the minister than the than the civil servants because I do think that a minister is responsible for a department ultimately and how you run your department defines what civil servants come to you with. So as a minister, you could say, I don't want to hear about that, that and that until it's at that stage because you, it's your job to deal with it. So I do think that there, there has to be some kind of an understanding between ministers and civil servants as to what's expected of them because any of us will know, any of us that have worked prior to doing what we're doing now and even when we're doing what we're doing now, that when you're working with somebody who is your manager, you have some kind of understanding of what you should do and at what point you go to them. And very often you find if you go to them at a point they don't think you should, then you end up in trouble for that as much as if you... So I think I'd like to find out more but for that reason to see what is that relationship because of all the issues you've raised, that, that, that could be a bigger, a bigger concern. Um, so I, I do think that we should write to the Minister. I think there would be value in us having the Minister come to the committee, and I was going to suggest this later, but I mean, it, it's coming up now, so we might as well. There's a number of issues that I think um, there would be value in having the Minister come into the committee on, and we should at least be planning for it, because I did raise around the Victims' Pension stuff on, on Tuesday that I think that it would be useful at some stage. Now, we've only just had the briefing from officials, I'm not suggesting that we have the Minister here next week on that issue. Yeah. There's a number of other issues right. as well, you know, even around COVID and, and this particular issue and the opportunity to ask, because writing is one thing, but we know how that goes. You end up at some point having to say, we need the conversation. So I'm content that we write, because that does draw out some of this yeah. stuff. So by the time you're having the conversation, you're able to go back to to look at and say, have, do more questions arise, arise out of the... The latter. So I, I certainly am content that we write to the minister and that we request that the minister, at some stage in the near future, particularly, I mean, be timely around the October monitor round and so on as well, come to the committee. I think. Yeah. And, and that that's down. You I'll, might have thought. <laughs> Fair enough. Brexit was another that I would like to talk to the minister about the as well. Issues, so, yeah. and there's a number of issues that I think we do need to have her in. It's been. A, a while since she was before us, but rightly we've been focusing on this bill and we'll be dealing with it mm -hmm. quite soon and, and we do need to have her in front of us. So yes. Rachel? Thanks, Chair. No, I was going to suggest that we invite the Minister for a week of reasons, but I have no issue with writing to her on those issues. But again, just reflecting with what Paul, Shane and Linda have said in terms of the process, why was it the 16th of June then? Did something happen in, on the 15th of June to make the 16th of June be the day? And then what happened between the 16th of June and the 20th of September? Because that's a significant amount of time, if it was such, a, such an issue. Um, I just, obviously, there's a lot, the statement was welcome, um, and I think it was very transparent, to be fair. There was a lot, there's lots of details in there that didn't, you know, didn't have to be in there, but they, it was. Um, and, and I think that was a good thing, but it has only raised further questions, and I think it needs to be clarified. Okay. Well, if members are content, we'll, we'll write to the Minister um, about this, um, based on the conversations that we've just had.
Okay. Um, then the other item is the response from the Minister for State, um, which I had touched upon earlier in the week, um, the effect of the Victims Payment Scheme. At our meeting on the 3rd of September, the committee agreed to write to the Secretary of State and the Minister of Justice and IFM-DFM requesting an update on discussions that are taking place and what progress has been made in identifying how the actual pension payments will be funded. The Minister for Justice responded, indicating her position um, in the UK government obligation to make this funding available for victims and has raised the issue with the Secretary of State. Um, she has also recently met with FMDFM and the Finance Minister and it was agreed that the four ministers should seek a collective meeting with the Secretary of State. And Minister Murphy is also engaging with uh, the Treasury. Uh, a response was received from the Minister of State, um, Robin Walker, uh, MP, and he stated the devolved funding settlement means that the executive is funded through the block grant together with its own revenue raising capabilities to fund statutory responsibilities, including this scheme. The letter did indicate that they will continue to engage in appropriate discussions about the scheme at ministerial and official level. So obviously there's ongoing work and engagement from the different ministers with an interest in this area. I think that needs to be pursued, but I do want to get an update um, once they have had that collective approach and, and meeting with the Secretary of State uh, on around progress. Um, so this is one that we'll, we'll keep a watching brief on, but it's the area, one of the areas, notwithstanding issues around eligibility of the pension, when the minister comes around the funding of it too, that we can change out further. So if members are content to note the update uh, as it currently stands, but that it's an ongoing issue that we're pursuing. Are we going to then request that when there is a further update, you know, request it now that as soon as there is a further update that we have some information around that? Because the font is the big one, you know, obviously I have, have yeah. other issues from my own perspective, but at the end of the day, nobody's getting anything yeah. unless this font issue is sorted out. And I'm concerned that victims took a court case and now expect an outcome. And if, if they have been led up the garden path and... and there's no fault in there. I, I'm really concerned about the impact that will have on them. I've been dealing with many of these victims over a number of years now, over the, the past four years, and I know where, where they're at in terms of, you know, just absolutely, they're at their wit's end. Yeah. They, they shouldn't have to keep fighting, and they, they all deserve, you know, as I say, notwithstanding some of the issues that we have around how the regulations were laid and, and what's in them. That doesn't take away from the fact that those severely injured victims that have been fighting for this for a long time deserve to um, to, get, to be paid and all victims, in my view, deserve to be paid and, and they should be in a position now where they no longer have to fight. And I'm just concerned that's not the position we're at yet for them. Well, we'll write to the Minister just saying that we, we would like to have I mean, you know, timely updates as to the progress of the work stream that she's identified. Um, and members, if you want, we can write to the executive office. We did write as a committee to FM, DFM, and we haven't had a response from the executive office. Um, but it, we're not the scrutiny committee for for that office. So, if members are content, we'll highlight it with the executive office committee. This is an issue that you know would be helpful for them to pursue as well. They may well already be doing so, but um, we'll we'll draw it to their attention. Okay. Okay. Agenda item five, um, the Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill, further consideration of clauses 9, 11 and 17 and pages 44 to 17 of your meeting pack and 23 to 217 of your table pack for the relevant papers. Um, clause nine, in respect of aggravation uh, where a relevant child is involved. At our meeting last week, the committee considered the text of the proposed amendment to amend the Child um, Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1968 and noted that the Department had indicated that it would ensure that non-physical ill treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is criminalised. It would also ensure that current references to an offence around unnecessary suffering or injury to a child explicitly state that this relates to the suffering or injury being of a physical or otherwise nature, again ensuring that non-physical behaviour is captured. This should enable matters such as isolation, humiliation, uh, bullying to be captured. The Department stated that assuming acceptance of the amendment, including by the Speaker, 
and this would make clear that it is an offence. So the committee had indicated that it was generally content with the proposed amendment to the Children and Young Persons Act of 1968, but had concerns about the ability of members to consider properly the Department's potential amendments, the clauses 11 and 17, to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17-year-olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation. A further discussion also took place with departmental officials on clause 9, and they agreed to consult with OLC regarding the wording of the clause to see if it could be enhanced to take account of concerns raised by members and or other uh, further clarification being provided in the explanatory and financial uh, memorandum. The Department's response is on pages 23 to 26 in respect of these issues. The response outlines that the advice given to the Committee on the equivalent Scottish provisions to Clause 9 in the Domestic Abuse Bill was incorrect. The Department has apologised for that error and set out the correct position both in its letter and in the corrected version of its written response to the issues that have been raised in relation to the Bill. The Department also indicates that it does not change uh, its view in relation to the sees, hears or is present provision. And in light of the discussion last week, it is proposing to amend the explanatory note by removing the reference at 92A2 and inserting text at the end of uh, the part relating to subsec subsection 2, 92 more generally. As follows, in regards to subsection 2, there is no requirement for the child to be aware of or understand the nature of the behaviour or for the behaviour to give rise to some detrimental impact on the child. Any involvement of the child could also be unwittingly or unknowingly. Um, and there's some correspondence members around Clause 9 that was received from Bernardo's, and that's in the table pack. So, for Director, Dr. Uh, Veronica Holland is available for members uh, by way of the Starleaf facility if further information or clarity uh, is required on this clause. So, Veronica, you're welcome uh, to the meeting, and this session is being recorded by Hansard, and that will be published in due course. So, members, um, it's to, to seek your, your views then in respect of, uh, first of all, if we want to take the, the issue around the explanatory note and the wittingly and unwittingly um, debate that we've had. Uh, we touched on this in closed session, members, um, uh, in respect to, to Clause 9. Paul? Yes, uh, Chair. Veronica, thank you for your attendance. Um, I suppose Clause 9 is... Uh, We've been through the ringer on Clause 9, um, and again, I welcome the commitment uh, with regards to the amendment in the explanatory notes, but can I ask when that, when, whilst we've seen the text, and I will read out the text for Hansard, uh, in regards to subsection 2, there is no requirement for the child to be aware of or understand the nature of the behaviour or for the behaviour to give rise to some detrimental impact on the child. Full stop. Any involvement of the child could also be unwittingly or unwillingly. Now again, I'm not really content with the last sentence, but I think that the first sentence is the key one there, uh, and explains it very well. And I also acknowledge that you're now moving it from subsection 2A2 to make it an overarching umbrella statement for the whole of Clause 9, subsection 2, which I welcome, and I think it's necessary. Uh, but I suppose I, I'll ask the question, when will we see that in text in the explanatory note? Paul, my understanding is that basically it will be when there's next a revision in relation to the explanatory and financial memorandum. So the next basically scheduled publish publishing of that would be after consideration stage when we have a revised version of the bill. Um, so for consideration stage, um, the the bill will be as, as, as put forward, but the department will obviously endeavour to get that into the expandry and financial memorandum at the, the earliest possible opportunity. Okay, and, and there's, no, there's no uncertainty in this, there's no cloudiness, it's so, definitely going in? Yes, there, no, there's there's absolutely no issue in relation to that. Obviously, in, in terms of the explanatory and financial memorandum, more generally, any further revisions to the bill as a whole um, will be reflected in those next revised versions. But we have liaised with Legislative Council in relation to the content that suggests a paragraph of the explanatory note and they're content with that. So there's, there's no issue over that. Okay. Again, 
But the explanatory notes is the next best thing. I still think, I'm still not certain that we shouldn't have it in the face of the bill, but I will reserve uh, judgment, if you like, on that just at this particular time, because if we can't get it in the face of the bill, and I understand the, the reasons why you uh, aren't supportive of that, then, of course, the memorandum then is the next best thing. Um, so I leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, and just on that point, Paul, th there will be an opportunity where um, bringing forward the committee's position at the plenary, um, we can seek a formal commitment from the minister um, to agree the wording of what would go in the explanatory note, and that's something that we could seek on the record at that stage as well. Um, Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Veronica, for attending today. I have a number of questions just on this, as you would expect. Um, in terms of the clause that we had been debating, um, we have been debating information that was given to us by the Department on a number of occasions, um, and, and we had raised a number of issues with it and been told that we could not have it in the explanatory memorandum because it was not in the legislation. So is it the advice of the Legislative Council that now says actually it can go in the memorandum because the legislation has not changed? No, I'm sorry. In terms of the the legislative me the explanatory notes or the explanatory and financial memorandum, um, given that that links to the provision as such and the desire on the committee's behalf um, to have cl further clarification in, in relation to that provision, there isn't any issue in, in terms of having that that included, given that it it ties back to uh, the nature of the provision more generally. Okay. Um, in terms of the realisation that it came to officials' attention that the understanding of the Scottish provisions and the advice given to the committee was incorrect. When, when did that happen? And was that from the Legislative Council or was that from Scotland? Or where, when did no, the, the realisation? Um, I suppose um, at the outset, what I should say, I apologise profusely to the committee in terms of that error. That error has rested with me. Um, it was a, a misunderstanding on, on my part. Um, at, at some point, um, my understanding in relation to those provisions has changed because we had earlier correspondence with Legislative Council and what have you, which was quite clearly setting out what the, the correct position was in relation to the uh, Scottish provisions. It was following the committee session and on looking at a, an unrelated matter in relation to the, um, the Scottish legislation that that came to my attention. So as I say, my sincere apologies in relation to that especially given the, the lengthy discussions that we've had on these provisions to date. No, that's right. I, know, I appreciate that. And I'm just, I, I've, re I've read the, the letter that um, the committee has been given with interest. Um, and, and also, I, it's surprising uh, for me that there doesn't need to be an amendment then to the legislation, given everything that we have discussed. Um, there's a couple of questions I have just with regard to the letter, um, and a specific one is that there would be a, an almost a, a watering down of the child aggravator. It served to weaken the impact of the child aggravator, um, and, and that's the argument being put forward that an, any additional provision into the legislation would serve to weaken the impact. I don't understand where that comes from. I'm just wondering if you have any information on if there was an, if there was an ad additional provision put in, how that would serve to weaken it. I suppose our, some of the concern that we have in relation to the additional provision is that it could be um, deemed to be quite broad. Um, our sense is that you could potentially have any behaviour where it's undertaken or relates to a family unit um, potentially could be encapsulated within this without necessarily um, due regard to the, the seriousness of it. So I suppose that's where we're, we're coming from in, in relation to that element um, of, of the letter. Uh, I suppose the other factor that we're, we're taking into account is our sense that um, the provisions that are in the bill at the moment which relate to the here or is present as well as directing behaviour um, we consider that um, you know that would also encapsulate those types of, of behaviours as well. Okay um, I'm afraid I, I don't agree with that in terms of, of it would it, it sufficiently captures it and I've, I think I've outlined that in the last couple of weeks so I don't need to go into that in detail but in terms of the, the concerns that the department has of it could be quite broad where does that come from is that from conversations in Scotland uh, because my understanding is that the Scottish uh, child aggravator has not been overutilized and it is actually 
um, you know, it, there, there's, there's room for it to be utilised more within, um, within court proceedings at the moment. So I, I just want to know where that, that assessment um, that it would serve to weaken the impact comes from. It's just in terms of looking at the, the drafting of the provision um, itself. We, we haven't specifically discussed this issue with Scottish colleagues in terms of the point about the utilisation of the child aggravator. I don't have figures in front of me, but from recollection, I think their aggravator has been used in around 25% of, of cases to date. It is something that we've got information from them at, a, at an earlier stage. So there's no sort of empirical or data evidence to show that this child aggravator, if it was put in in the same way in Scotland, would weaken the legislation? Not in terms of empirical data, it's, it's more in terms of consideration of the, um, the, the nature of the, the provision. Obviously, I appreciate that but committee members may have a different view from the department in relation to this. Okay. Um, I th I'll leave it there, Chair. I, th I think you know my feelings on Clause 9. So. We do. <laughs> have a lot of sympathy for them as well. Linda? Um, I share the concerns actually of the department on this one and, and which is why I felt that if we could do it within the explanatory note because my concern was around the the directed behaviour at the child and made use of the child and what the understanding was that in the um, explanatory note. So for me the change in the explanatory note was actually the best way to do it. I still feel that it's the best way to do it because what I feel needs to be captured is captured within the actual clause itself. However, it's the it's the explanation of what that means that is not right within the explanatory note. So, I mean, my view of it was that we had more or less settled on 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 that last week, notwithstanding Rachel's views around the the need for the amendment done to be in line with the Scottish. Um, legislation but haven't had all the discussions and we have had extensive discussions around this and I think that's only right because it is so important and, and the issue around children and, and what they see or don't see in relation to domestic abuse and how that impacts on them is, is a major issue and we do need to address it. So I feel that this actually goes further than the Scottish legislation which I think can only be a positive but you would like to think that our, our bill should go further than the Scottish legislation. We should be learning from the good practices of other legislation and, and adding to, not simply copying or having less. And that would be the biggest concern. You certainly wouldn't want to have less. So for me, I think as long as we can get those assurances, and from my point of view, and I agree with what the, the chair has said, obviously we can get it on record, but it's on record now. We've had assurances now on several occasions from the department. I don't think it would reflect well on any department to backtrack given the number of assurances and the amount of times that we've discussed this and that it is on record. So I certainly would be more than disappointed that if it wasn't in the explanatory notes. And I think we can, at this stage, given the amount of times, the amount of members that have put it on record, and to the fact that the department officials have put it on record a number of occasions too, I would be confident that it will be in there, yeah. but it absolutely has Can to I be. Can I perhaps advise members on if it provides more reassurance up front? It's certainly something that I'm sure the minister would have absolutely no issue referring to in her speech um, in terms of the next stage in, in the Assembly on, on the floor of the House to make clear that she intends to make that amendment to the um, explanatory and financial memorandum as soon as possible. Rather than members having to seek insurance from her. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sinead Bradley. Sorry, I'm not sure if you hear me now, yes, Chair. We can. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it, just that we have exhausted, um, I suppose, a lot of the debate around this. And like Linda, I was reassured. Um, when there was reference to the possibility of, you know, putting something in to change the explanatory and financial memorandum. But um, I just, I suppose I would like it noted that although I don't think um, my opinion weighted heavily on any anything that was given by the department that may have been done an error, I do feel obliged to maybe retrace my thinking and see how much weight um, I'd relied on, but I, I, 
from what's presented, um, I think I'm still in the same place on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. There's no other members on, on this. Um, it's my view the committee's in a position to say that it'll be supporting Clause 9 um, as drafted um, with the condition that the explanatory note is going to be changed as outlined. Um, and Rachel, you want to... Chair, I am not content to, to support that position um, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, so, members, that's the informal deliberation on that. There will be a formal vote on it uh, when we get to that stage of proceedings, but um, we will proceed from that element of the conversation and move on to clauses 11 and 17. Um, so, members, this relates to the exception where responsibility for children and the exception regarding the aggravation. So the department indicated last week that the child cruelty offence only applies to those under the age of 16 and having liaised with colleagues in the Department of Health as well as colleagues in the police. The department is not aware of similar child protection provisions that can be easily adjusted to explicitly deal with non-physical ill treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in the context of a parent-child relationship. Uh, the department was therefore considering uh, reducing the age threshold for their parental responsibility exclusion from under age 18 to under age 16 by way of amendments to clauses 11 and 17 in order to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17 year olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation. In the absence of this, there is the responsibility, or the, there is the possibility, that it may not uh, be possible to address the non-physical ill treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in that context. So, uh, concerns were expressed that, without having the views of key stakeholders and clearly understanding any implications or consequences of reducing the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion from under age 18 to under age 16 they would not be in a position um, to consider this properly and form a view on it. Departmental officials indicated that they could try to seek the views of the NSPCC and other stakeholders before the meeting today. The department uh, contacted uh, the organisations and those organisations responded uh, directly to the committee. Uh, the department has highlighted that the organisation's view remains that children should be wholly captured within the domestic abuse offence and the parental responsibility exclusion per se should not apply. They have not directly commented on the proposed reduction in relation to reducing the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion, assuming that the child cruelty offence amendment is made. Okay, members, so that's just a recap on, on where we are. Obviously, we were aware for a number of weeks now that the Department was working with the Department of Health to uh, provide a proposed amendment, which would be a new clause after clause uh, 20. Um, but in doing so, the, in providing that amendment, it identified this issue for 16 and 17 year olds, and hence uh, these other amendments to clauses 11 and 17 um, that are being suggested. And that's where members indicated um, about trying to get the views of, of stakeholders. In respect of that, um, just to, to help the debate on this for, for my own perspective, um, I've been aware of the, the work with the Department of Health um, to try and get an amendment and I've been sympathetic to that and I've been supportive of the policy intent behind it and I believe that that amendment achieves that. Um, however, the subsequent consequences of that by way of the issue for 16 and 17 year olds is one that um, I haven't been able to satisfy myself that I've given it proper deliberation and the organisations that have responded haven't specifically dealt with that matter either um, and have reverted back to their view about wanting the, the, the issue being dealt with as a whole. That is a debate that we had a number of weeks ago which goes into much broader child protection legislation um, as opposed to being able to address those issues in this bill and, and so it creates an issue for me whereby the committee, uh, as a committee position, is being asked to support uh, or otherwise amendments uh, which we only became aware of a week ago and we've had a call for evidence, we've taken opinions and so on and we haven't been able to do that. It's not to say that I don't support the amendments but my own view is that the committee hasn't been able to, to carry out its process properly to have a committee uh, position on it. So. 
That's my own view. I'm at a kind of halfway house position on it, whereby I can support the new clause 20 um, and that amendment, but I'm not in a position whereby I feel that as a committee I can suggest um, we would support the other two amendments. That's just my own view on it to facilitate um, members' discussions around this. Linda? I agree with you in terms of concerns. I don't think it is ideal. What I would want to know is if we don't accept the amendments, then what is in place of it? What looks after the 16, 17 year olds? Because we can't leave that gap. Um, and I accept the, the position of the organisations that have responded. But as you say, Chair, we discussed that a number of weeks ago and um, took a position in relation to it. Now, unless we're going to go back and, and look at that again and, and really start from the beginning almost, that, that we're discussing that again, I don't know. But other than that, what, what, what can replace this? If, if we don't support this, what will replace it? Because for me, the worst outcome is that we don't have 16, 17 year olds included in some way. They have to, they have to be catered for and protected. So the organisations have went up back to their original position, but they haven't stated an opposition to this. Certainly haven't stated any great support, but they have. To, they want. They want the position they want, and they maybe think it would be weak in that position to say, but we'll accept this. So I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm sort of in the same mind as yourself. I'm. I'm not happy with it. I'm not content with it. Well, but I'm less happy to think that 16, 17 year olds are not going to be. Yeah. Can, uh, captured in some way, but. Can I tease out? Another way. Can I tease out with Veronica? Part part of my thinking on this has been. Um, as to why I would support the, the amendment that introduces the new clause around the child cruelty that has been worked up with the Department of Health. Because if we don't accept any of the amendments, then we don't address the issue for those that are under the age of 16. Uh, and that, that then would create this gap for 17-year-olds right the whole way down. Uh, and so my, my own view has been to accept the proposed amendment it deals with those up to the age of 15, um, but did that really still leaves the 16 and 17 year olds with this potential gap. Is, is my understanding correct, Veronica, in terms of my thinking that the new clause would strengthen the, the provisions of what this bill is intending to do for those under the age of 16? Yes, in, in terms of the, the attention of that health amendment in relation to section 20 is to deal with the, the non-physical ill treatment or injury to a child under the age of 16 and as, as Linda and, and you have pointed out the issue is then in relation to the 16, 17 year olds. As Linda also rightly pointed out and I suppose when we were discussing with NSPCC and, and Nikki what I had made very clear because um, I, I suppose we knew what their, their position was likely to be in, in relation to this provision and obviously as you've alluded to very very keen in terms of um, children being bought within the, the gap of domestic abuse offence more generally and the parental responsibility exclusion being removed. I had asked the question, appreciating what their position is, can you please give us a view on if the, the child protection amendment were to be made, what then happens or you know what should be done in, in relation to the um, parental exclusion responsibility and as I say notwithstanding the fact that I knew this wasn't a, a preferred approach from them as Linda says there, there hasn't been comment back on that explicitly equally they haven't objected um, to the suggestion of the um, reduction from 18 to, to 16 in terms of that threshold albeit that the focus has been very much on what their preferred approach is more generally but yes Paul as, as you say it, or yes Chair it, it, it would the intention of that provision is very much to um, um, give added protections in relation to those under the age of 16. Okay. Um, Rachel, were you trying to get into Thanks, right? Chair. Yeah, um, I would share concerns. Just I have, um, I don't really fully understand the implications of 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 the the proposed amendment because it we've only had it for for a week and a bit. Um, but I do recognise the difficulties of introducing a kind of arbitrary distinction between legislative protection at 16. So it's not ideal and that needs to be addressed. And NSPCC did raise um, 
the issue that abuse of children under 16 would carry less of a penalty than abuse of children age 16 over, um, because they would be treated under two different bits of legislation. Um, and I must understand that um, the committee is probably not going to go back to have the parental responsibility argument. I would welcome that, not a problem. Um, I'll happily have it. Um, but unless I, we're obviously time bound now, but I, I, judging by previous conversations, I don't think that the committee's minded to go down that route. Um, and remove 11 and 17. Obviously, the children's lobby has suggested that that would be an easier fix to all of these problems. But I haven't seen any um, information or any evidence on the potential consequences of removing 11 and 17 and what that would bring. The scope would just be it would, would be huge, and I, I would need more, much more time and information to look at that. But could could there be a change then to um, Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act to allow for maximum penalties then? So there isn't that arbitrary distinction? Another curveball. Because um, the NSPCC, I think they said five years, but it was 10, whereas our maximum penalty in the domestic abuse is 14. So that would move that, remove that arbitrary distinction for abuse of a 15-year-old or versus a 16-year-old being treated as two very different things, but they're the same. In terms of the um, change to uh, penalty, that's, that's obviously a, an issue in terms of health legislation. And, um, you know, that, that maximum penalty has been chosen when that um, legislation comes into force. It wouldn't be feasible um, to have a, a, a different maximum penalty, which would obviously equal um, what is in the domestic abuse bill. Um, but do appreciate that there is something of a, a disparity between the two, um, and I suppose then in, in terms of kind of the, the approach more generally and, and the rationale behind um, that amendment, it is really um, in terms of um, wanting to ensure that for those for children that the the issue is dealt with through child protection rather than domestic abuse legislation, um, or that seemed to be a, a more appropriate route in relation to that. Just to just to confirm, so the the to change the level of penalty within the Children and Young Persons Act then couldn't be done through this. Um, I suppose the, we're attracting that provision for the purposes of um, the, the domestic abuse element. Um, it would obviously be a matter for health, and I would imagine they would be you know, the the threshold and penalty associated with that offence has been chosen from that wider health perspective. Um, you know, it, it would be a matter for, for health to look at that. I can't imagine, um, albeit that it's not something that we have discussed with them, but I would imagine they would be reluctant to increase the penalty that's associated with that, given that that provision obviously has been in place for quite a number of years. Sorry, Chair, just to confirm, but we're changing the scope of the legislative, the Children and Young Persons Act by adding in non-physical abuse. So surely the penalty that's existing within the Children and Young Persons Act at 10 years is only there because it's not, it, the non-physical isn't yet covered. We're changing and adding in provision for non-physical abuse of children. Therefore, would that not necessitate a change in the penalty? The provision in terms of the health side of things is to deal with both physical and non-physical. And, and in terms of the position that was adopted in relation to England and Wales on this, the, the view at the time was that it was to make explicit that it dealt with um, non-physical ill treatment, but it, it's obviously a, a wider provision in, in terms of dealing with both physical and non, and, and through this here, making explicit that it's non-physical ill treatment of a child as well. Okay, I'm still a bit confused about it, but I'm happy for other members to come in. Okay. Um. There's no one else is indicating um, at this stage, and I don't want to go back over the previous debate, but I, I accept the department's position that child abuse, child, the over the wholly addressing children's abuse is dealt with by Department of Health legislation. Um, but this addresses within the context of this bill an issue that was brought to our attention as part of the evidence that we we had sought. People fed into that. The department has responded to it and brought forward the amendment. My only uh, concern has been the kind of knock-on effect of this amendment in requiring changes to uh, clauses 11 and 17. So I'll, I'll be supporting the other amendment, but when it comes to these amendments, um, my own view is that we as a committee should note the amendments. We're under a duty to 
um, take positions on the clauses of the bill. Um, we don't need to be voting on the, uh, these amendments, um, notwithstanding the, the issues that the department is wanting to deal with. Um, we can complete our committee deliberation and reporting, um, noting the proposed amendments to clauses 11 and 17. Um, but we can also indicate that we, I would like to see what assessment the department has made around the implications and ramifications of these proposed amendments. Um, and I would need to, to have a lot of detailed work on that, which the committee could consider following our report having been completed and issued. Um, so that I'll invite the clerk to comment on it. Sorry, I just want to clarify um, if the committee just wants to note the amendments, this is the time to do that now. When we get to formal clause by clause, we would have to put the question and you would have to agree it or not agree it. So if you just want to note it, it's at this time you need to note it because then the question will not be put on that amendment. So members, I'm clear what I'm trying to do. I'm happy to support the proposed new amendment for clause 20 that deals with the child cruelty issue. I accept that that creates a knock-on effect that these proposed amendments to clauses 11 and 17 are seeking to address, but I haven't had the same time to consider these proposed amendments as I have been able to when it comes to the issue around child cruelty being dealt with for those that are below the age of 16. So it's, it's a halfway step for me as to, to where I can get to. Um, and um, I feel as committee chairman, the committee would be um, in, a, in a strong position to be supporting uh, the new clause. Um, but as a committee, we haven't had the same opportunity to, to work through the implications and deliberate around the proposed amendments to clauses 11 to 17. However, I remain persuadable as an individual MLA and as a party to support them if the department brings them forward in consideration stage and further consideration stage. Um, so I'm withholding my position on the other two amendments. Um, so that's my position. I don't know if I need to be formally saying to the committee, is that a position that the committee wants to take um, or whether others have a different view? Again, I'll go back to my point. I'm concerned about the impl implications of not doing it. But if we could get information around that, then that we have an opportunity to, to look at that before the consideration stage. Is Are there any implications in not looking at it before that point? Well, it's a, I would like to the know. procedural issue for the committee is today we have to formally agree the clauses, so we're not going to get further information um, to inform our formal consideration of it. So whenever I'm saying that the committee can engage in this further, that will be out with mm -hmm. the formal role of this committee. It will not form the committee report. If we were to park this issue in its entirety, then it will not form the committee's position. Um, Chair, I, I'd be happy enough as for the report to state that we couldn't uh, take a determination or judgment on it given the time scale. Um, I think that's a valid enough position. It'll be up to the department whether they move their amendments, surely. So, you know, it's it's on them as to whether they support an amendment or not. They, it may well be a, a good thing to have a committee uh, determination on it, but again, you know, we, we were waiting on these f for a while, so there's nothing to stop the committee saying we just haven't had the time to actually look at all consequences. Okay, Rachel. Happy with that as well. Um, have the health committee been informed about this? We haven't engaged with them. This change in health legislation also not be a matter for the health committee to consider as well. I don't know how if that's how that works, but. That would be, I suppose, out with our role, um, so I, I can't answer that. We haven't engaged with them as a committee. Um, I, I, I have no problem if we want to take the position that when it comes to the proposed new amendment um, at Clause 20, and when it comes to then the consequential amendments that are proposed at Clauses 11 and 17, that the committee's official position is we didn't have sufficient time to reach a considered position on it. Um, we did ask repeatedly for these amendments so that we could see it. Um, 
Uh, but as a committee, we haven't been able to, to carry out our functions in, in the time frame that we would wish to have done so as a result of not having that information uh, at an earlier opportunity. I, I have no problem with that. Um, I suppose I've indicated that when it comes to um, if the department brings forward this amendment, I'm clear that I'll be voting for the amendment um, when it comes to the issue around under the 16 and the new clause and the party will support it. Um, but there is an issue for officially how a committee reaches a position and considers things and the processes that we follow by calling for evidence, taking that evidence, deliberating through it, considering all of the knock-on potential implications um, and obviously in the future proofing this, something goes wrong, they look back to how the committee carry out its work um, and I think there is a degree of vulnerability um, for the committee in agreeing to the proposed amendments to, to 11 and 17 in that context. Paul, sorry Chair, if it's helpful, just if the only, if the issue is the, the amendments to clauses 11 and 17, um, what the committee could do if wished was to build the amendments and indicate they didn't have enough time, but we can include in the report that the committee wishes the department to provide further information on the implications of both the, those amendments and if they weren't done and any other options to address that gap. We could highlight if the committee has concerns about the gap um, and the committee can consider following um, the report on the bill, the committee can consider any other information that the department brings um, before consideration stage. So you can consider that um, at that stage if you want. It just will not be reflected in the committee report um, because by that stage we'll be past. Mm -hmm. Um, committee stage completion. I do think it's important we get those implications because equally as much if we supported it, if we don't support it, there could be implications, you know, at a later stage that, that will come back to bite us where people will say you allowed this to happen and now sixteen or fifteen, sixteen year olds, fifteen, seventeen <laughs> year olds are not covered. They've they've been left in limbo. And I, I am concerned about that, but I'm content with, to proceed in the manner in which Christine has outlined, which I think is in line with what you were saying yourself, Chair, yeah. that we would we'd note it but, and ask for the further information in relation to what the implications are if we don't do it as well as if we do. And if I can just bottom out, though, because the proposed amendment to 1117 is a consequence of new clause 20A. So... It's important that... This, this, that's what I want to know, is the committee able to take an agreed committee position that we will support new clause 20A, yeah. um, and, but these knock-on amendments at 11 and 17 requires us to note them, but seek all of these further information, and that's something that the committee can consider out with its reporting duties. Okay, are members content then that that's, sorry, Sinead Bradley? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I think that's a fair um, way to go forward. You know, from the soundings I've heard at committee, I've not actually heard any voice of objection to this. But I think it's reasonable to say that we don't feel as informed as we could be. And it may well be the case that the department moved this. By the time that happens, um, we may be able to, in the chamber, support it, although it wouldn't be obviously through the constructs of a committee, but it would be on record that there is actually no objections if that's what comes to pass. Okay. Okay then members, I'm, I'm content that we proceed on the basis of acceptance around uh, the new clause 20A and as I've outlined and Christine's elaborated on the position around noting, um, but then seeking all of this other information that the committee can consider um, with the normal process of our committee report. Christine, are you clear? Um, yes, thank you. Sir. Um, I assume the committee will want in the committee report to reflect that um, they want to see the gap for 16 and 17 year olds addressed properly um, and fully yeah. and therefore want the department to come back with further information. Okay. Okay, then members, that 
uh, concludes our uh, deliberations on the clauses of the bill and the formal clause by clause consideration will then take place uh, later in the meeting. Um, that is the place where it's a, a yes, no or abstain scenario. Um, we've debated all of these things and members have brought a huge amount of scrutiny to that um, and expertise on it that I think has been incredibly diligent of members in the way they've went about their business um, and the uh, expertise that they've been able to bring to this and as a testament I think of how this committee operates and the kind of rigour that is applied to it. I can, I'll say more about that at a more appropriate place but we will do the, the formal clause by clause later in the meeting. Okay, members. The, uh, Veronica, can I thank you for, for joining the meeting um, and your uh, explanations. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, we're going to take the October monitoring round um, and whenever that's concluded, we will break for a 15-minute recess um, to allow preparation for the formal close-by-close -close consideration. So we'll, we'll move on to the October monitoring round and finance update. And um, the relevant papers for members are pages 79 to 120 of your meeting pack. And uh, members may wish then to discuss with officials uh, these issues and be referred to the Senior Assistant Clerk's memo at pages 79 to 81. And that should be helpful for members' consideration. So can I welcome uh, Deborah Brown, Director of Justice Delivery Directorate in the Department, and Lisa Rocks, Deputy Director of the Financial Services Division from the Department and uh, just advise the meeting will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript published in due course. So uh, Deborah, can I hand over to you to provide a brief overview? Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. <laughs> Listen, let's take a 15 minute recess now at <laughs> this stage of the meeting and we can come back to this item and we will move into formal close by close. So members will reconvene in 20 minutes at 4 o'clock. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, members, uh, let's go back to the, the uh, item on the agenda in terms of the October monitoring round, and I think the technology should be working now, and I'll invite Deborah to give us uh, an overview of the monitoring round. Deborah. I'm just trying to Hi folks, um, we're, we're happy for Hello, can you hear us okay? Yeah. We can, and mm -hmm. we're, we've started the session here now, so we're ready to hear Deborah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Deborah will just be short, joining us in a short moment. Whenever you are ready, we're, Sorry, live. Tell everyone. We're, live, we're live and broadcasting, so take your time. Okay. So nice, Joe. Thank you for the opportunity to update the committee on the department's October monitoring round position. Um, as you have already said, I'm joined today by Lisa Rocks, the department's finance director. 
When we were asked at the committee in June, we noted that the department's budgets were in a state of flux and that it had been a uniquely challenging period in terms of finance as with everything else. We noted that we could not offer the same level of certainty as usual this year. Since then, in the context of this uncertainty, we have sought to keep you updated on the position in terms of cost pressures arising from COVID-19 and how those have changed over time. We also provided updates in areas such as the main estimates and review of financial processes. I hope you will take our approach as a clear signal of the value we place on the supporting role of the committee and we want to ensure that you are kept up to date with the financial issues that we face. We welcome your views and we hope the briefing and the presentation is helpful to the committee. Today we want to update you on where we are in terms of the current financial year as part of the October monitoring round, which will also include where we are on the pressures arising from COVID-19. We will also touch on a proposed approach on reporting of monthly forecast outturn. Before getting into the detail of that, let me first talk about the next budget. We have come through a prolonged and sustained volume of work in relation to the continued challenges of COVID with the October monitoring round, whilst also starting the planning, looking ahead to the next budget setting period. It is anticipated that this will set the budget for the period of 21 to 24 in terms of resource and a further year to 2025 in capital. You will recognise the challenges this creates amidst the uncertainty around what budgets will look like in the coming years. It is also a challenge in a complex department with five agencies and eight non-departmental public bodies, where it will take some time to prioritise in line with the Minister's priorities. DOF commissioned an exercise in mid-August with returns due last week. We continued to work on the exercise until early this week when we submitted a first response following an early discussion with our Minister. In making the response, we have highlighted that the information will continue to be refined in the coming weeks. We have scheduled an oral session with the committee for the 4th of November in which we will discuss the departmental position more fully once we have had an opportunity to further refine this work. We will provide written briefing in advance to give the committee the opportunity to identify the areas that they want to explore further. Turning now to the main area of discussion for today, the October monitoring round, including the update on COVID related costs. When we last attended the committee on the 4th of June, the June monitoring round had been completed before we could fully understand the impact of COVID. At that time, we highlighted 1.9 million of resource easements and a million pound of capital easements, which helped to reduce the impact of absorbing some of the COVID pressures. We subsequently wrote to the committee on the 5th of August and provided an update following the initial COVID-19 exercise. The COVID pressure of 17.3 million was submitted to DOF and 13.5 million of funding was allocated by the executive to DOJ leaving a remaining pressure of 3.8 million. Given the uncertainty around COVID pressures in this area, it is deemed prudent to confirm actual allocations as part of this October monitoring round. The committee will be aware that a further COVID-19 allocation of additional funding exercise was commissioned by DOF and the department submitted further bids of 5.6 million in resource and 1 million in capital. On the 9th of December, the department wrote to the committee to highlight the resource bids were not successful. And due to changes in our assessment of the financial position since the original bids were submitted, they were deemed no longer required. In addition, there was a reduced capital requirement of 5.5 million, which was notified to DOF. This is a further sign of the uncertainties facing all areas across the financial year. These changes were as a direct result of COVID uncertainty. In terms of the income of the courts and police recruitment in resource terms, and driven by issues with the PSNI supply chain and their reduced capacity to deliver on capital projects. As part of the October monitoring round exercise, all pressures and easements were reconsidered by the department. 
Several pressures identified in the COVID-19 exercise were reduced and other areas emerged. In addition to funds held for reallocation to pressures, easements totaling 1.5 million were identified across a range of areas across the department. Based on more up-to-date assessments on COVID pressures, funding was released back to legal aid of three million pounds, where activity was greater than originally anticipated. 4.7 million was released to prison service to maintain critical services and for the anticipated impact of the working time directive and 7.5 million towards court pressures as a result of a loss of civil fee income. In addition, we have been able to allocate an additional 1.5 million to legacy inquests. As part of the October monitoring round, we are highlighting the need for an additional 4.5 million for EU exit. You will be aware from the June monitoring round briefing that DOF has already been informed of this bid. We understand work is ongoing between HMT and DOF and an outcome is awaited. This funding relates to 308 officers and staff who are already employed and were funded last year. We do not anticipate any issues but continue to press as PSNI require this funding. In terms of capital, additional requirements of 1.3 million have been identified. The majority of this relates to prison service in relation to learning and skills at McGabry, a perimeter wall at McGilligan Prison, and investment in the women's facility. This can now be funded from internal easements that have arisen. As mentioned previously, you will be aware that as part of the most recent COVID-19 exercise, a reduced requirement of 5.5 million was reported to DOF. This is now formalised in the October monitoring round, and this surrender was made with the caveat that the PSNI EU exit capital bid of 1.1 million will be met. Overall, taking all of this into account, the department leaves the October monitoring round in a manageable position, taking account of current known met pressures that we need to manage. Moving briefly now to the monthly forecast outturn for 2021, you will note from your written briefing that we are suggesting that any significant variances of our forecast outturn against budget will be reported to the committee in tandem with the Finance Committee, and I would welcome your views on this approach. You will note in terms of the monthly forecast outturn 2021 for July, there was a variance of 5.3 million in capital, the reasons for this was mainly due to slippage in PSNI, approximately 3.6 million relating to vehicles, in prison service, approximately 1.3 million in respect of IT, and in the court service, about half a million between IT and some buildings. I'd like to provide a health warning on this. This is a variance in a monthly forecast rather than an overall budget variance which of course is of much more significance. So for example, if we were to expect a significant capital spend in one month, but it fell into the next, there would be a significant variance to report under this mechanism, but overall there may be no issue in budgetary terms. I would welcome your views on the proposed approach to reporting of forecasting variances, and we are happy to provide whatever is most helpful to the committee. In conclusion, I hope I have provided a useful overview of where we are now in terms of the department's financial position. We continue to operate with uncertainties around COVID-19 and our budget remains subject to more flux than would usually be the case. We will continue to keep the committee updated as our position develops. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to brief you today. We very much value the role of the committee and will continue to engage with you. And we are, of course, now happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, that's very much appreciated. Um, just a, a couple of questions from me, um, more around the October monitoring round templates. Previously, we had received the June monitoring round templates that have been provided to the Department of Finance. And is that something that we'll get from the department in terms of the October monitoring or template? Yes, there's. Sorry, they're due for submission today, so happy to share those with the committee.
thank you. So this is obviously our opportunity for you to feed back, and if there's anything that you raise, we, the, the submission isn't due till tomorrow, but once they are submitted, we will, of course, provide them to the committee. Okay. See the, um, the monthly variances. Is there a criteria outlined as to, to what, what is significant by way of the variance? <laughs> So, no, we don't have any specific guidance from DOF. Um, basically, we will supply this to them, and if they have a particular query or whatever, they will come back to us. So there is no percentage that is set. Um, and so, therefore, what's more important is really what's the impact of that variance um, on the overall profile that you see um, to the end of the financial year, and does it have any budgetary consequence? And that, of course, is the thing that we're most focused on. Um, I'm sure you appreciate in the current climate, the profiles that we had of our spend were very difficult to predict because we couldn't go by past experience because COVID, of course, is changing the way we operate and the timing of the things that we can do. Okay. Um, I suppose that's going to be important to identify you know, what the criteria will be as to what triggers telling the committee you know, where there's a significant um, variance and... We're going to need some clarity on that as to what that will be um, and you're right how that then relates to the overall budgetary position putting it into that context is important um, I appreciate things can fluctuate on a month by month basis that, um, in terms Deborah of um, the funding can I just ask around the easements and the uh, money that's being held centrally um, sure. How much? How much is being held centrally by the department? So we have about two million of easements that we're holding centrally. Um, but you'll notice that we only allocated seven point five million out to courts for the reduction in their income. Um, they were forecasting a little bit more. They think they needed maybe about one point four million more. So of course that two million would be held um, so that we could contribute towards that. We have a few other unknown costs um, with. Re with regard to people working from home, um, we have supplied people with laptops and screens, etc. But the other thing that we're looking at now is do we need to provide other equipment um, around desks and chairs and things like that. So we're setting aside a little bit of money there just in case that comes through as well. In the case of legal aid, um, you'll know that from the, the last round, um, we were anticipating about £15 million pounds of an easement there in legal aid which was bringing their um, budget down to 69 million, I think it was. But as we looked at the profile of how that actually has panned out with, with, with um, COVID, um, we've realized that actually they may need some more money. So that's why we're putting 3 million back in. Um, and in addition to that, then there are some exceptionality cases that are coming up in legal aid. So it's prudent that we have that little bit of 2 million pounds that we could maybe pull on should any of those things materialize. So that's our situation at the moment. And we think that that's a prudent position to take. Okay. Linda Dillon. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the Chair has answered or asked some of what I was going to ask, and so it's covered, and I'll go back over any of that. Just in relation, obviously, to 21 24 and 21 25 in terms of resource and capital, and, and I accept that there are challenges, particularly given the, cir the partic particular circumstances that we're in. But would you not agree that it's a good position? It's the position that departments have been asking for for years, and that you know, the organisations within the departments have been asking for for years. So I'm, I'm just, I suppose, I'm asking, do you think that's a better position to be in than where we were previously, where it was year on year? You could, like, I don't believe you could be strategic in that. I couldn't be strategic in my own home with that kind of a, a budget moving yeah, forward. So I'm sure absolutely. I'm, I mean, the department took a position about a year ago that we were starting to look at our future planning on a much longer um, term. So we'd looked, started to do work on three-year budgets for resource and ten for our ten three year planning for resource and ten years for capital and indeed that really helped us whenever this this exercise you know got started that we were able to draw from some of that material obviously then having to look at it in the context of COVID but it was a very challenging time scale um, it's a challenging time scale in any ordinary times but even more challenging because obviously we're operating in a very different way in COVID with quite a number of our staff working from home. And so the interactions are very different from what they would be in real time when people are back in the office. And that's why when we say we've, we've made our initial return, we want to spend some more time with the minister working our way through that and refining it. And then hopefully by the time we come on the 4th of November, we'll have a more settled position. But it's only settled as, as 
in the context of what we know of COVID at the moment, and we just don't know how things are going to change every day. There's a, there's a different dynamic that is presenting some challenges for us around COVID. Can I just ask one other question then in relation to um, the, the budget information gathering process and missing the deadline? Are there any implications in relation to that? Obviously, I note that you have said you want to come to the committee, which I think the committee appreciate because we like to see as much, um, I suppose, conversation and engagement with the committee in all of these processes. But that is until November. And if you've already missed the deadline, that then extends missing the deadline by another month. Are there implications in relation to that? So we have submitted our first, our, our initial return. So that went in on Monday after we had our discussion with the minister. Um, and just as other departments have done, we've made DOF aware that we're going to continue to be refining this as we as we move through the process. Um, DOF is also um, um, organising bilaterals between minister, you know, with individual departments, ministers, and the, the, the DOF minister. So that will inform some of the, the discussions around this as well. So I see this very much being an iterative process um, and plenty of time to, to, to to refine and to reshape, you know, um, as people as we take on board people's comments and be clear about what actually is achievable in some of the time scales that we have. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Paul Frey. Yes, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Can I ask just on that the, the next budget, twenty twenty one, and whether it's a one year or a three year budget, but uh, more about the process in this year. So you've. If I, am I right in saying that you've submitted something to the Department of Finance? Yes. So when, what exact, when was it exactly was that? That was on Monday, Monday after we, we had our meeting with the Minister on Monday morning, went through the figure work with her, um, and then she agreed that that could be submitted to the DOF with the caveat that we, we reserve the right to be able to amend and, and change as we work our way through that. And indeed, after this, I'm on my way to a strategy session with our minister, which is going to help us you know, try and, and focus in on what are the key priorities um, and to look at the bids that we put forward to see how we might start to prioritise them in the event that you didn't get everything that's in there. And can I ask, what is your understanding of the process from this point on? Is there any key dates that have been given to you by the Department of Finance? <clears throat> So, I mean, as I say, the bilateral is being organised at the moment um, and then obviously we're up in front of yourselves. I'm not sure about, because obviously with the with the autumn budget now um, being postponed, um, DOF have said that we just stick to the timelines that they gave us, um, but I'm not sure if there's anything more we can say at this stage. This was, it's determined, as Deborah says, by what's done in the UK and the assumption was that the Northern Ireland might get the block budget towards the end of October. But again, it's very much dependent on what happens there, and the bilaterals are another sort of step in the chain of understanding those responses. So that will only really kick off the Northern Ireland process, more so when we know what the envelope is. Okay, can I then ask, with regards to your plans and the submissions you've given to the Department of Finance, were you given any guidance, or did you use any guidance around a programme for government, albeit in a draft form? Not as part of the initial stage of the information gathering, um, although my understanding is there's an ongoing process which is seeking as part of NDNA to align the multi-year programme for government to the budget by next April. And I, that will continue to develop and I would assume would become part of the DOF plans in terms of the budget, but not at this stage of the process, no. Have they told you with regards to the uh, Department of Finance given you any guidance as to what a monitoring round will look like? in a multi-year budget? They haven't said anything specific, but our understanding it will be as it always has been. Um, the monitoring rights will follow the same, the same pattern that they have previously. Okay, Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Gemma. Thank you. Um, I just have one um, quick question. Um, in the case of a second, deadly second wave of COVID, um, which hopefully won't, but might, see the need for the use of kindergarten temporary resting place. Um, will there be any additional costs, do you know, um, associated with that? So um, at the moment, um, we um, have secured this um, with a, through a licence with MOD in the event of a pandemic. So costs are covered for this year um, and we're further scoping um, how, this, how this will pan out. 
and we're working with a range of, of partners, um, including local government, the funeral directors, the public health agency, DOH and the funeral sector to plan for a potential increase in deaths during the pandemic. Um, given the rising number of cases and the risks associated with the winter season, plans are in place to retain this resting place throughout the pandemic. Um, and we're also looking at options to ensure that as part of our civil contingency arrangements in Northern Ireland, that there is a resilience capacity then for, for the longer term. Okay, thank you. That's me. Okay, thank you. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it, it has been covered, but there were another couple of points I heard about uh, capital easements. You mentioned seven million there. And then you refer to the PSNI accounting for a large part of that five and a half million that was surrendered. But it talks about that that was things it can understand the supply chain and capacity to deliver on new place cars. What I don't understand then is the assumption that's made after that. It says the department um, surrendered that five and a half million, which would have been for capital projects, on the basis that the PSNI EU exit bid of one million is funded. Are those two the same thing? What, would, what was the intention of the, ins, the spend around that one million for the EU exit bid? So the EU exit capital bid related to <clears throat> the cost of the protocol, and that's being dealt with separately through Treasury. So it's it's a different funding stream. So we're handing back the block money of the five and a half but comes with the caveat of the PSNI would still need then the capital funding under the protocol. Okay, so that EU money was in the 5.5 million. It's just that you've handed back one set of money that was for one thing, but you're basing it on the fact that you've got capital money coming for an EU exit bid, which seems to be another stream. And would it not have been earmarked for different things? So the 5.5 million is, is a reduction specifically around, you say, the supply chain, the procurement, etc. Yeah. So that is an actual easement and that is surrendered. Yeah. The other part is to do with the EU protocol, which is the 1. million which is needed for that. That is a separate pot of money. And so we have said to DOF, we are surrendering our ordinary pot of money on the assumption that we will get the 1.1 out of the EU funding pot. And that is our understanding, as it is on the resource side, that that is the way this works, because it's a separate pot of money from the EU money. So that links to the bid with 4.5 million in resource for the 308 officers and staff. OK, but I'm just wondering, would that money not have been due to you anyway? That that one, that one point, that million pound bid would have been made anyway for the EU exit bid. Yes. So had those easements not happened in year, what would that money then have been directed towards in the EU exit bid? If the PSNI had needed the five and a half million for vehicles and were able to spend it, they still would have needed the one and a half on top. So the two things yeah. are sort of just... So, yeah, I, I, that's my understanding. So I don't know how then it was on the basis. I still don't follow how it was on the basis of receiving that money. I suppose it's that we could have technically said we would only give them back the net, but then because they come from two separate funding pots, DOF would ask us to treat the two things separately. So I suppose we were highlighting the risk when we were surrendering the five and a half. We were saying this is on the understanding we will still get the one because arguably we could have netted. it. But on DOF advice, we're treating them separately because they're completely distinct funding streams, one from Treasury and one from DOF. Okay. I'm just concerned that there may be then a need for EU exit money that's not there because it's been used to fill a gap for operational capital that should have been coming from another stream. But on that same sort of thread, do you anticipate there being any significant other um, surrenders of money between now and November? So we, we have spent a lot of time on the capital and, and back um, at June monitoring round, we pushed everyone around COVID, what are the implications here in your capital, surely it's going to have an impact. Um, we had some business areas that were able to come back and say, well, actually, we have a few smaller projects that we're going to bring forward. So the, if we have problems on procurement, etc., because of COVID, we can manage those. So we've continued to push on this um, and this is the latest position. 
but we don't know how COVID is really going to pan out over the next number of months. So at the, this point in time, based on all the information that we have, this is what we think our position is. But I absolutely couldn't say that it's, it's not going to change because the world is changing at a pace and in a way that none of us could ever have imagined. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your information. Um, Fig 10 uh, on Annex 1 here in, in our information uh, is a quick summary. It talks about 54.8 million. Is that money? Is that money all being committed in expenditure? Or was that an estimate of cost? So that 54 point million is the costs um, over the 1920 and 2021 period, which appears um, in the audit office report, which was done um, at a point in time. Um, we reported to you pressures um, in 2021 um, of 51.8 million. Um, since we reported those, um, those costs have come down by about 11 million um, to do with the police's estimation around over time um, refinement around some of the costs we had um, in prisons and in courts. Um, and then we had some new um, pressures that came up, which were around um, the working time directive um, of 5.6 million. So the, the pressures um, on COVID um, in 2021 look like they are more around the 46.3 million. Um, and of course, we continue to keep that under review um, as, as the, the period progresses. So that, that's expenditure from about what, February to, to date then, from February 20, from the whole thing kicked off. Would that be fair? It, it covers to the end of this financial year. Those are anticipated costs to the end of this financial year. So yes, from, from COVID hit in March right through until the end of this financial year in March 21, those are the anticipated costs. Okay. And it's interesting, you know, the prisons are 11.5, the courts are 12.1, and the police are 13 million, and EPA is 11 million. They're all similar values, but... Um, you would assume the police obviously have a lot more activity and, and have to go out to interface with the public and, and all the, the pressures of um, doing that. The prison service, the, the prisoners were, the number of prisoners were reduced. I appreciate there uh, of other pressures about trying to keep uh, COVID out of the prison, which they've done very well. Um, but you do wonder. Um, is all of that money really justified? And I, you know, I, I know the pressure is on, and the, the risk is still there. But in relation to PPE as well, is there now a stock of PPE built up with it across the organisation? And as you've mentioned in your right, the uncertainty is still out there, and the risks are high. But um, is there a, will there be further demand for for more PPE to be purchased? So. Um there are stocks of PPE in each of those organisations, um, and there is um, a piece of work that is done, being done collectively by CPD and ICS wide. Um, and so um, all of our business areas are continuing to engage with them and secure the PPE to make sure that we are we're, we're well stocked. Um, I wouldn't have any figures on, on that, obviously, um, but the indications are that at the moment there isn't an issue with supply of PPE. Okay, so the bottom line is we're likely to spend 50 odd million uh, extra. This is all additional costs. It's not, this is not, so the, it's not correct. So these, are, these are all additional running costs as a result of uh, COVID. We're going to spend so, 54 million up yeah. to the end of this financial year. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, by 46 million. Um, not all of them are running costs um, because within there, um, because of COVID, we don't think that the courts are going to be able to bring in the same level of income that they would normally. Um, so that's obviously a consequence of courts not being able to conduct their business um, as they have um, done previously. So they're not all running costs because of COVID. They are the consequences then um, um, of COVID as well. And so similarly, you know, uh, there's a lack, there'll be a downturn in activity in, in LSA. So the, there's a reduction in the need for legal aid um, just because of the activity elsewhere. Just on the courts, are we likely to see a, um, a step up in the activity within the court system? We are aware that there's, that there's a slowness, is not the uh, effectiveness and efficiency that there was. And obviously, COVID is a major factor, but are we likely to see an increase 
in court activity within the next few months? So um, court activity has um, has increased. I think we've eight venues now open um, across Northern Ireland. So I don't have the actual figures in front of me. Um, and then, of course, um, there are other um, areas looking at, um, I think, what they're calling the Nightingale Courts, um, to see what can be done um, in order to get some business back up and running. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Emma? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, other than the capital bid submitted by um, the PSNI in relation to Brexit, can the Department outline any other significant pressures likely to arise from Brexit, given we're now 91 days out from the 31st of December deadline? I suppose the main one for us would be the PSNI bid in relation to 308 officers and staff who have been in employment with the PSNI for the last couple of years. So that's what the PSNI have identified as the costs in relation to the protocol. And there's nothing else that has been identified as significant at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. Following on just on the topic of Brexit, I've asked about um, departmental budget planning for um, various scenarios of what will happen after the 31st of December. Has there been any um, discussions or scoping done about what additional costs a no deal or deal Brexit would be ha have on the on the department apart from the PSNI? In terms, I suppose, looking back, there was previous planning done on the no deal scenario. Linda Hamilton is probably best placed to give the more up to date position. Certainly what's coming through as part of our information gathering exercise are the costs in line with the protocol. Um, yeah. That, that's, well, obviously the, the department's working through this. If there's any changes in any of the costs, we will, of course, um, take that on board. Um, and we're so happy to come back to you with, with those specific questions that you've put forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. As Emma said, we are 91 days out, but even just the, the briefing that we got from the Chief Constable last week and about certain aspects of um, certainly cross-border justice and, and the European arrest warrant, data sharing and so on, and the slowness that that will, will uh, inevitably have on the system if we have a no deal, um, which obviously would rather not have. But if that does happen, will there be any extra expense on the part on the on the department? And, and that's what I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not saying in that. And I appreciate that work is still ongoing. But uh, if there is any updates, I would certainly appreciate that. Um, in terms of bids made from the PSNI, has there been any bids made from um, the police to get to the seven thousand five hundred level that was promised in New Decade New Approach? No. Not as part of the current year budget, but um, they're planning to increase to 7,000 officers before the end of the current year based on reduced overtime costs. And in terms of the future years, that'll be picked up as part of the information gathering exercise based on the strategic outline cases which have been presented by the PSNI. Okay, thank you. Um... In terms of the... Um, Paul had touched upon a programme for government, a very elusive one still outstanding as far as I can see. We don't have a programme for government. We have a new decade, new approach wish list, and we have an old programme for government. So you'd mentioned there about discussing the minister's priorities. Is, that a, a, is there a list of priorities that the minister has that is outside of a programme for government in the absence of one, or how is that being decided? Is that, it's just, a, a, I don't know how, how, how um, finances then would stack up against a programme for government without one. But with a, a list, is is there an elusive list? So there's, there's no elusive list. Um, what we're going to be doing is talking through with the minister what she sees the priorities, you know, over the next, um, you know, year, two years, which will then help inform how we'd shape um, where our funding would be would be directed. Of course, NDNA will be in there with Gillen, etc. Things that are in the programme for government, outcome seven, all of those things will be things which will obviously are things that we'll want to make sure we're, we're focusing on, but it'll be a question of what can you do within these time periods? Is it realistic about the kind of money that you're asking for, etc.? Um, so that we're trying to work all of those through, but your points are very well made and it is a huge challenge for us. Okay, thank you. Um, and lastly, um, I can't remember what page, what, sorry, page 81, I did write it down. 1.1 um, million in relation to tackling paramilitarism. Is there any, any indication of what this is for? Um, the 1.1 million pounds that's drawn down as part of the October monitoring round is in addition to 6.6 .6 million, which was drawn down in the June monitoring round and is consistent with the prior year spent where the lion's share of that funding 
the total 7.7 is five and a half million pounds to the PSNI for the paramilitary crime task force and another significant element is 1.3 million pounds for probation board for the Aspire programme. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other members? Okay, if not, can I thank Deborah and Lisa um, for the presentation that you've made today. Uh, there's a, a number of other questions um, that the committee will want to ask and we'll follow that up in writing. Um, but for now, my appreciation. Thank you very Thank much, you. Sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry about the start there. <laughs> no, not your fault. Not your fault. No, at least you could have held the fort rightly, I'm sure, for you, though. <laughs> I was about to launch in. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it next. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, members, well, if you're content, um, there's a very good paper there uh, with a series of other questions that weren't covered, and if you're agreed, we will see uh, written responses to them. Are members content? Okay, uh, members, let's move on to item seven, which is the formal clause by clause consideration stage of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. So if I can refer you to pages 122 uh, to 171 of the meeting pack of the relevant papers. That includes the clerk's memo uh, setting out the um, <coughs> that includes the, the clerk's memo uh, in respect of this setting out the committee's position following the deliberations on the clauses of the bill which took place at our meetings of the 10th, 17th and uh, 24th of September and a text of a range of amendments provided by the Department of Justice. Uh, so we'll now go through the formal clause by clause of the Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill and the proposed amendments. So the way to, to handle this is that I'll proceed through the clauses of the bill in order as they appear and put the questions formally. Um, to advise members that where there are amendments to a clause, uh, I will put the question on the amendment first. Where no amendments have been proposed and no issues have been highlighted, I'll seek the agreement of the committee to group those particular clauses when putting the question and the question on each amendment that introduces a new clause to the bill will be put at the relevant point. So if members are clear as to how we're going through this, I will proceed. And forgive me if I just take a little bit of time to make sure I get it right. Okay, so clauses one to four um, is the domestic abuse offence. Uh, what amounts to, the, to abusive behaviour? The impact of the behaviour on the victim and the meaning of the behaviour and how it can be carried out. Um, so if members are content to group clauses one to four for the purposes of putting the question. Members content that we group them? Good. Okay. Is the committee content with clauses one to four as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Sinead. Agreed, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Apologies. <laughs> um, clause five, meaning of personal connection. Is the committee content with clause five as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clauses six and seven, establishing connection by notice and how notice is to be served. If members are content, I'll group clauses six and seven for the purposes of putting the question. Is the committee content with clauses six and seven as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, clause eight, aggravation where the victim is under 18. Um, <coughs> the department provided the text of a proposed amendment to tidy up the wording of this clause. So is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the Minister to Clause 8? Agreed. Agreed. And is the committee content with Clause 8 subject to the amendment proposed by the Minister? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 9, aggravation where relevant child is involved. Um, the committee considered the proposed amendment by the Department to amend the child cruelty offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act when considering this clause. Uh, the question on that amendment will be put after the question on clause 20. Um, that is where it appears. Is the committee then content with clause 9 as drafted? Agreed. Okay, Rachel is indicating not agreed. 
uh, others are agreed. And I, of course, the caveat with that, Chair, is the amendment to the uh, memorandum of yeah. uh, notes. Okay. Um, clause 10. Behaviour occurring outside the United Kingdom. The Department provided the text of a proposed amendment to tidy up the wording of this clause. Is the Committee content with the amendment that was proposed by the Minister to Clause 10? Agreed. 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 And is the Committee content with Clause 10 subject to the amendment proposed by the Minister? Agreed. 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 Clause 11, exception where responsibility for <laughs> children. So the Department has highlighted that the Child Cruelty Offence in the Children and Young Persons Act in Northern Ireland 1968 only applies to those under the age of 16. In order to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17 year olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for in legislation, the Department indicated that it would welcome the views of the Committee on possible amendments to clauses 11 and 17 to reduce the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion from under age 18 to under age 16. The Department outlined that in the absence of this, there is a possibility that it may not be possible to address the non-physical ill-treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in this context. Earlier in the meeting, members agreed that they had not had time to properly consider this proposed change and clearly understand any implications or consequences of it, and therefore the committee agreed to note the potential amendments by the Minister. Therefore, is the committee content with Clause 11 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 12, Defence on Grounds of Reasonableness. Is the Committee content with Clause 12 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 13, Alternative Available for Conviction. The Department provided the text of a proposed amendment that would insert provision for the avoidance of doubt as to the effect of the Criminal Law Act 1967 to make sure that there is no risk of implying that the provisions in the 1967 Act are ousted by what is contained in Clause 13. Is the Committee content with the amendment proposed by the Minister to Clause 13? Agreed. Agreed. And is the Committee content with Clause 13 subject to the amendment proposed by the Minister? Agreed. 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 Clause 14, penalty for the offence. Is the Committee content with Clause 14 as drafted? Agreed. 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 Yeah. Clauses 15 and 16, aggravation as to domestic abuse and what amounts to aggravation. Members are content at group clauses 15 and 16 for the purposes of putting the question. Is the committee content with clauses 15 and 16 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 17, exception regarding the aggravation. The, cir the circumstances relating to clause 11 also apply to clause 17, and the committee has noted the potential amendments by the minister. So is the committee content with clause 17 as drafted? Agreed. 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 Clause 18, meaning of personal connection. Is the committee content with clause 18 as drafted? Agreed. 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 Clauses 19 and 20, establishing connection by notice and how notice is to be served. If members are content, uh, we'll group clauses 19 and 20 for the purposes of putting the question. Agreed. Is the committee content with clauses 19 and 20 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, members, the new provision to amend the Children and Young Persons Act in Ireland of 1968. The Department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to amend the Child Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act in Northern Ireland 1968 to ensure that non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is criminalised. Is the Committee content with the amendment proposed by the Minister to insert a new clause to amend the Child Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act, Northern Ireland, 1968. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and members, uh, when there's a new clause added to a bill, we need to then recommend that to the Assembly. So the next question is that the Committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the bill. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 21. Uh, no right to claim trial by jury. Is the committee content with clause 21 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 22, special measure directions in criminal cases involving domestic abuse. Is the committee content with clause 22 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Clause 23, the prohibition of cross-examination in person in criminal proceedings. Is the committee content with clause 23 as drafted? Agreed. 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 Yeah. 
Clause 24, meaning of offence involving domestic abuse. Is the committee content with Clause 24 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. New clause to provide powers to the Department for measures to protect and support the victim or alleged victim. The, the committee has agreed to bring forward an amendment to provide for the Department to make provision for measures to protect and support the victim or alleged victim by way of regulations within 24 months of commencement of the Act, similar to domestic abuse protection notices and orders. Is the committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause to provide powers to the Department to make provision for such measures? Agreed. Agreed. That the committee recommends to the Assembly that the new clause is added to the Bill? Agreed. 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 Clause 25. Guidance about domestic abuse, that the Department has provided the text of its proposed amendment to change the word may to must, uh, requested by the Committee. Uh, the Committee has agreed to bring forward an amendment to enable the Department to make, by way of regulations, uh, provision for informing the school of a child who saw, heard or was present during a domestic abuse incident. So is the Committee content with the proposed amendment by the Minister to Clause 25? Agreed. Agreed. And is the committee content with the amendment to clause 25 to provide for the department to make, by way of regulations, provision for informing the school of a child who saw, heard or was present during a domestic abuse incident? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members. Um, is the committee content with clause 25 subject to the amendment proposed by the minister and the amendment proposed by the committee? Agreed. 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 Okay, the new provision to provide for the department to issue guidance on the data to be collected. Um, remind members just that the uh, committee agreed to bring forward amendment for the department to issue guidance on the date to be uh, on the data to be collected. So, if I can put the question: uh, Is the committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause regarding guidance on data collection? Agreed. Agreed. And that the committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the Bill. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members, a new provision to place a duty on the Department regarding training. And the committee has agreed to bring forward an amendment to place a duty on the Department in relation to training for the effective operation of this legislation. Is the committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause to place a duty on the Department regarding training for the effective operation of this Act. Agreed. 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 And that the committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the Bill. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, a new provision to provide for independent oversight of Part 1 of the Act. And the committee has agreed to bring forward an amendment to provide for the appointment of an independent person to oversee the implementation of Part 1 of the Act. Is the committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause to make provision for the appointment of an independent person to review, report and make recommendations in relation to the operation of Part 1 of the Act as drafted. Agreed. Agreed. And that the Committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the Bill. Agreed. Agreed. A new provision to require the Department of Justice to report on the operation of the Act. The Committee has agreed to bring forward an amendment to require the Department of Justice to report on the operation of the Act at intervals of three years and to publish and lay the report in the Assembly. Is the Committee content with the amendment to insert a new clause to, to require the Department of Justice to report on the operation of the Act as drafted? Agreed. 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 And that the Committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the Bill? Agreed. Agreed. A new provision to amend Article 12A of the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995. The Department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to amend Article 12A of the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995 so that a court considering an application for a contact or residency order will be specifically required to have regard to the conviction of the party applying for the order for the new domestic abuse offence where the child aggravator has been applied. Is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the Minister to insert new clause A26 to amend Article 12A of the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995 in relation to factors relevant to residence and contact orders. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. 
and that the committee recommends to the assembly that the proposed new clause be added to the bill. Agreed. 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 Clause 26, prohibition of cross-examination in person, family proceedings. The department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to correct a small error that occurred when the bill was being processed prior to introduction. Is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the minister to clause 26? Agreed. Agreed. And is the committee content with clause 26 subject to the amendment proposed by the minister? Agreed. New proceedings to provide for court rules for special measures and family proceedings. The department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to insert a new clause to provide for court rules to make provision so that victims of domestic abuse are automatically eligible for consideration of special measures in family proceedings. Is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the minister to insert new clause 26A to provide for court rules for special measures in family proceedings? Agreed. 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 And that the committee recommends to the assembly that the proposed new clause 26A be added to the bill. Agreed. 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 New provisions for the prohibition of cross-examination in person and civil proceedings generally. The department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to introduce a new provision to provide for a court hearing civil proceedings to have a discretionary power uh, to prohibit cross-examination in person and to require a court considering whether to exercise its discretionary power to prohibit cross-examination in person, to have regard to findings of fact made in civil or criminal proceedings as well as family proceedings. Is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the Minister to insert new clause 26B to provide for prohibition of cross-examination in person and civil proceedings generally? Agreed. Agreed. And that the committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause 26B be added to the bill. Agreed. Agreed. New provisions to provide for court rules for special measures in civil proceedings. The department has provided the text of a proposed amendment to insert a new clause to provide for court rules to make provisions so that victims of domestic abuse are automatically eligible for consideration of special measures in civil proceedings. Is the committee content with the amendment proposed by the minister to insert new clause 26C to provide for court rules for special measures in family proceedings? Agreed. Agreed. And that the committee recommends to the Assembly that the proposed new clause 26C be added to the bill. Agreed. Agreed. Clause 27, commencement. Is the committee content with clause 27 as drafted? Agreed. Clause 28, short title. Is the committee content with clause 28 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, and the long title, um, as this is the end of the clause by clause consideration of the bill, the committee now uh, can consider the long title of the bill. Committee content with the long title of the bill? Agreed. Okay, members, um, that concludes the formal clause by clause consideration of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. And uh, can I formally thank members for your cooperation? and work in respect of this. Um, there's a significant amount of work now for uh, the committee staff to continue by way of drafting the report um, for the committee to be able to sign off on, on the report. But at this stage, my appreciation to Christine and her team um, for the excellent way in which they went about supporting this committee and committee members and seeking information, trying to identify exactly what these members are wanting uh, clarity on, and their professionalism has been exceptional and has helped members to carry out its work uh, in, in a way in which I think we can be uh, very uh, confident of that we have carried it out in the proper fashion by way of the scrutiny that it needs to be given, um, but in a time frame. Uh, which is uh, exemplary um, for other committees to look to and as aspire to. And so my appreciation to the committee and um, staff for that. Linda? I just very quickly want to put on record my own thanks to the, the committee staff and also to Stephanie from the Bill's office for all of the work that they've all put in. And I think the greatest thanks I can give them is to keep it that brief so that they get home at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Um, okay, members, well, we will have to consider the report uh, whenever it comes to the committee in due course so that we have some more opportunity to look at that. Um, so, item eight, and um, hopefully we can proceed through the rest of the business today um, as quickly as possible. But uh, item eight then 
Um, if I can refer members to pages 173 to 184 of the meeting pack. Um, the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to remove the multiple conviction rule by which Access NI is required to automatically disclose all convictions relating to an applicant for standard and enhanced checks. Where that applicant has more than a single conviction held on their criminal record, this would bring the filtering scheme in line with the UK Supreme Court judgment in January 2019 which found that the disclosure of all convictions held on the criminal record where an individual had more than a single conviction was disproportionate and would not comply with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Exemptions will remain in place where an offence is specified or where a conviction includes a penalty with a period of imprisonment. Uh, these offences will always be disclosed as long as they are retained on the police national computer. The changes regarding multiple convictions has operated on an administrative basis from the 16th of March of this year and the proposed statutory rule will provide the statutory basis for the change. The Department has advised that no consultation took place as the change is required to bring the legislation in line with the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the rule is subject to the affirmative resolution procedure and will come into operation the day after it is affirmed by the Assembly. So members, if you're content um, with the proposed statutory rule, then we'll agree that we're content. Agreed. Chair? Yes. yes. On that, have we any idea of the offences that will be remain on, on, within the system? You know, will the, those guilty of sexual abuse of children or whatever, will that still remain or will after 11 years, will that be removed? Well, th this we had looked at and in terms of the previous week, whenever we had considered what the rule related to, so um, we had went over that um, and the Supreme Court ruling on it, but uh, Christine, is there any more information that you want to provide, Gordon? Are you happy, Gordon, to get this? Because we had agreed it last week. This was the formal just agreement to it. Right, maybe get clarification on it. Just what yeah, we can get that details in. of what wins will remain. It does talk about that, but it's not clear what they are. Yeah, well, well, we'll get you the information on that. Right, Members content. You. Okay. Item 9, um, the police retention and disposal schedule. Pages 186 to 269 of the meeting pack. The committee initially considered the retention and disposal schedule for the PSNI at the meeting on the 10th of September. While no issues were raised, the committee requested confirmation that the policing board had sight of the schedule and details of any comments raised. The policing board's response indicating that it did not have sight of the schedule was noted at our meeting last week. The committee agreed that it had no issues to raise in relation to the schedule. So if members are content uh, with the PSNI retention and disposal schedule. Yeah, just just on that, I think it's, it's a very good document. It's important that it obviously would, the information would be passed down throughout the whole organisation consistently. Um, it is an issue that comes up now and again. And the only point is just the, there's no review of it on, on, until another three years. Those, they obviously have looked at that and probably think it's reasonable, but a three year review. It's not difficult to do a review, either I think maybe every two years would be more reasonable, but every three years they're talking about. It is a rather complex document, there's a lot of detail, but it's just a point it would make, maybe the frequency of it should be looked at at some time, but I'm happy to let it go. Linda? Not specifically on the, the, the PSNA end of it, because that's, that's, for their, that's for their thing, but just in relation to the... DOJ consultation around the legislation, and I'm happy to get this in writing. But I'm aware that obviously we have already dealt with this, and I don't want it to keep coming back on the agenda. So I'm happy just to get some clarification around when that consultation is um, is ended. Then can or will the PS now make any adjustments that will reflect the consultation? But I'm happy just to get something in writing, Chair, and not. Back over this again. Okay, well, if we, if we raise that with the department and also the point Gordon made around the period to review three year, two year issue, if that's something that they can provide more information as to why it couldn't be more regular. Thank you. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, sure. Sorry, Sinead, yes. Sorry, it's not directly related, but I think it's worth noting at this point, uh, given the statement that was made in the House this week about an error. Um, you know, and the fact that they may have to revisit some of those cases, 
I'm just wondering, is there a caveat in here? Um, obviously, you can't retrospectively go back and gather up evidence again if there had to be a retrial. Just thinking what's in there, you know, it may be just something that we should give thought to. Okay. Okay, members. Um, item 10, review of sentencing policy in Northern Ireland, report on responses to the consultation. The department has provided a summary of the responses uh, on the consultation and reviewing the sentencing policy in Northern Ireland. That consultation sought views on sentencing policy generally and on a number of specific areas where sentencing had raised particular challenges for the criminal justice system. It covered 10 discrete and separate sentencing policy issues of concern and the summary sets out the views expressed for each of these areas. Uh, having considered the responses, the Department believes that further research, development and discussion with uh, stakeholders and respondents is required on a number of issues. The Department also intends to consider other related developments, for example the proposals for Harper's Law, uh, where those who kill emergency workers would be jailed for life, a private member's bill in Westminster to increase the maximum sentence for causing death by dangerous driving, and the outcome of the independent review of hate crime legislation in Northern Ireland. Given that the consultation concluded in February of this year, the Department intends to publish a report on the responses at this stage to provide an insight into the responses received and an assurance that work on these issues is ongoing. So members, I'd be pleased to see that report um, published. So are members content sure. to... Yes. So sure. Is, is it worthwhile us writing to the Minister um, and ask, will she um, take on board the will of the Assembly uh, and consider an LCM in regards to Helen's Law um, uh, and get her feedback in regards to that? Um, I reflect on that, bearing in mind that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing here in the responses that um, there, there is no clear um, majority in favour or retaining whole life tariffs. So as many want it as there is don't want it. Well, it's it, certainly in the context that she's indicated here, or the department has indicated, they're going to, to carry out further work around Harper's Law, and I know in the Assembly the Minister indicated um, they were going to be looking at uh, that issue as well, um, that we had debated. So I'm happy to sure. raise that. I'm okay with this asking the, the Minister to look at it. I raised in the Chamber that I wasn't content that it would necessarily be an LCM, so I don't want the Minister to think that we would be content with an LCM. It doesn't give us any opportunity as a committee to scrutinise. I'm not absolutely opposed to it, but um, it wouldn't be my preferred option, so I wouldn't want the view of the, the Minister to be that that's a committee view, so just to... to can can I just come in on that? And, and I get that, and I remember um, your, your very um, clear points that you made. Um, Linda, I guess the, the point is you're right, we need something which is bespoken for ourselves, you know, and that gold-plated um, uh, legislation. But in the meantime, an LCM could cover that gap because um, we're not likely to get anything in this mandate. So th that's why I would ask for the consider of the LCM while we consider our own legislation in the long term. Well, if, if you're happy just to try and, and take it forward, the Assembly did pass a motion, and how the Minister intends to respond to that motion. Um, I, I would like to see what the Minister says in that respect, if, yep, absolutely. if you're content with that. Um, okay, Members, well, this is an area that we've debated on a number of motions in the Assembly, so the sentencing framework and so on is, is one that we need to keep under active consideration. So. Uh, as soon as we get more information in terms of the, the work stream, <coughs> at some stage we'll need to pencil in uh, an oral briefing with the relevant officials, and it may well be um, this will be one of the topics we'll add to the Minister's list and set aside two days for that session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chair, just on that, this is a summary of responses on the consultation, so there, there will be further work on this brought forward to this committee. Yes, the, the department's going to publish a report right. indicating how they intend to um, advance some of this or what further work streams that they need to carry out. So um, we, can, we can pursue that with them whenever that report is published and, and we'll want to tease it out further with them.
Interesting, Chair, that the issue of sentencing for offences causing death by driving was the most popular topic for comment. It's a very serious issue out there and needs to be addressed, and I think we're all very aware of the amount of lobbying there's been about it, and the injustices there has been over it, and I think it's something that needs to be looked at urgently. Okay, members, item 11, um, pages 917 to 944, the department is proposing to undertake an eight-week targeted consultation on the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Police Service of Northern Ireland Reserve Injury Benefit Amendment Regulations 2020. The regulations make provision for payments to officers who, through no fault or negligence of their own, are permanently disabled as a result of an injury received in the uh, execution of their duty or where death results from such an injury to surviving dependents. The amendment to the regulations will ensure that those who joined the police pension scheme established by the 2015 police pension regulations have the same access to benefits provided through the police injury benefit regulations as are available to officers who are members of earlier pension schemes. It will also allow for technical updates relating to uh, employment support allowance and incapacity benefit. Uh, so this is the first phase towards implementing the findings and recommendations of the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, uh, Injury on Duty Schemes for Officers in the PSNI and Prison Service that was published earlier this year. So members, it's there um, for noting uh, at this stage by way of the proposed consultation and that we can consider the matter further when the results of that consultation are known. Members content? Agreed. Content. Um, item 12. Uh, access NI issues, pages 946 to 955. At our meeting on the 3rd of September, the committee considered information provided by the Department on amendments to the Access NI filtering scheme and the Minister's proposed policy that rather than a blanket non disclosure of uh, youth court disposals, um, NCDs, no such information should be disclosed before it is independently scrutinised by the Department's independent mm -hmm. reviewer of criminal record certificates. Uh, disclosure could therefore still be made of a youth NCD where the reviewer believed that non-disclosure would undermine the safeguarding or protection of children and vulnerable adults or pose a risk to, of harm to the public. Uh, the committee agreed to request information on whether the department had consulted the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, the Justice Youth Justice Agency and other key stakeholders on the proposed policy and if so, what were their views? The department has responded indicating that no specific or separate consultation was undertaken on this proposal. The Department is aware that the Children's Commissioner and other groups representing young people as well as organisations such as NIACRO would prefer to see the full implementation of Recommendation 21 of the 2011 Youth Justice Review System in Northern Ireland which specified actions in relation to young people which are set out on page 947 of the meeting pack. The then Minister David Ford, however, considered the recommendation of the Youth Justice Review alongside the outcome of the consultation of Sanuta Mason, uh, Mason's review of the management of criminal records in Northern Ireland, uh, which also took place in 2011, and decided to implement a system of filtering of old and minor convictions and non-court disposals, as recommended by Mrs Mason rather than the Youth Justice Review recommendation. The Minister remains concerned that a blanket policy of no longer disclosing youth non-court disposals in any circumstances could potentially create safeguarding risks to vulnerable groups. In this matter, the Minister has given considerable weight to the views of the Independent Reviewer of Criminal Record Certificates, given her experience on these issues. Uh, the Minister has also sought to reassure the Committee that the proposed scheme would not mean that a youth NCD would be disclosed for all time and account will be taken of statutory guidance. In addition, an individual will have an opportunity to make representation to the uh, independent reviewer prior to disclosure of the information before a decision is made. And the Minister has requested the views of the Committee on the proposed policy, which would require an amendment to primary legislation and could be included in the Justice Miscellaneous Provision Bill. So, members, your views for those that want to give it, Linda. Um, I accept the concerns around the issue, but I also accept the, the concerns around why you can't just have a blanket approach to this because we could potentially have serious safeguarding issues. Um, and I think for that reason, 
I understand why the Minister is this approach. Just my view as well. Sinead Bradley. Yeah, very similar. It, there does seem to be, um, I suppose, a lot of questions still here in terms of safeguarding. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not in a dissimilar position, but I've nothing more to add. Okay, well, um, I'll take it that the committee is generally supportive of the department's position on this. Ultimately, if it's going to require primary legislation, the, the justice bill, it's going to be something that okay. they'll consider in a lot more detail when it comes forward. Um, I actually think this has become more of an issue, Chair, around the whole I suppose, social media and what they call the revenge porn and things like that. This, this has actually become a, a greater issue than it maybe would have been previously. So uh, for me, that just even makes it more difficult and more complicated and complex, but it's why you can't have a blanket approach. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll indicate to the Minister the Committee's position on it, but notwithstanding, it'll be something that we'll scrutinise whenever it comes forward in the, the legislation. Okay. Um, the next item is the Committee Forward Work Programme, um, page 957 to 965. Um, the department has provided a list of the items of business that it would like the committee to consider at the meetings in October and as agreed at the meeting on the 3rd of September, an informal discussion of the forward work programme priorities for the rest of the year and early 2021. It will also be scheduled later in October once the committee stage of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill is completed. So if members are content, we will schedule the items that have been requested by the Department for our meetings on the 8th, 15th and 22nd of October and um, we want to try and identify a suitable date to have the Minister come before us and we can put plans in place for that and the issues to be covered in due course. Agreed. Okay, members, there's no oral evidence session planned for uh, the 8th of October. Correspondence. Five items of correspondence, and in the meeting pack there are two items. In the table pack, I'll draw attention just to one item in the meeting pack, and the items in the table pack, and then members are free to comment. Item one, um, in terms of the information in that, there's a response from the department regarding the introduction of a Places of Worship Protection Scheme for Northern Ireland, and what further action can be taken to assist Places of Worship who have experienced Tax. The Minister is currently assessing the current evidence <coughs> need for such a scheme in Northern Ireland and the response also outlines a number of support mechanisms currently in place. Members are content to ask the Department to advise the Committee of the outcome of the Minister's assessment and we will send a copy of the response to the organisation that had raised the issue with the Committee. Agreed. Agreed. Item Six, there's a response from the Minister of Justice regarding difficulties that students who have been offered a place at the Institute of Professional Legal Studies for this year are facing in securing an apprentice position in a law firm due to the consequences of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. The Minister has indicated that the regulation of the solicitor profession is the responsibility of the Department of Finance and the Department uh, for the Economy is responsible for matters of higher education and training. Also advised, the Department of Justice has been informed that the Law Society has taken a number of steps to help those looking for apprenticeships this year, including extending the registration date from the end of August to the end of September, considering allowing late applications, waiving the £187 registration fee and allowing greater flexibility over when the apprenticeships actually start. So information is there for members. Um, Note. I always found it strange that the Department of Finance looked after the regulation of solicitors. It, it does. So. Um, okay, then item seven in the table pack. There was a letter received from uh, Dr. Steve Aiken, MLA, to the Speaker and all committee chairpersons on issues around the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol, and the Internal Market Bill, and a lack of clarity from the Joint Committee. Um, just to advise members, the, the letter um, that was sent hadn't been considered by the Committee for Finance and therefore cannot be regarded as a letter from Dr Aiken in his capacity as Chair of the Finance Committee. So if members are content to note the correspondence from Dr Aiken. Great. Are members content to action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet? 
Agreed. 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 Okay. Um, Chairman's business, uh, just to, to highlight that the Speaker has written to all committee chairs uh, providing a copy of a letter from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, which provides the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service Administrative Guidance for the EU Exit Transition Period Statutory Instruments. The guidance covers engagement uh, with Assembly Committees, including an alternative approach to address a request that draft SIs are not shared with Assembly Committees until they have been laid in Parliament. Um, the Senior Assistant Clerk will consider guidance provided by Assembly officials on the role of Committees in relation to uh, statutory instruments and further information will be provided to the committee. The clerk and the senior assistant clerk will also discuss the arrangements with the Department of Justice officials. Okay, any other business? Chair, could I, could I just... Um, Chair, I've, I've got a, a real concern, and it might feed into the, the forward work programme, uh, but I have got a real concern about the laissez-faire approach. Uh, of our Justice Minister to some justice issues. Uh, and if I can outline my concerns quickly, um, first of all, her refusal to chair um, or sit on the COVID enforcement working group, even though she was requested to sit on it. And we still haven't been given a rationale uh, why that is. And I think this um, committee should understand the rationale and why she is not willing to chair that, having, having been asked. Um, I'm also concerned that we got nothing back from the Minister in regards to the obscene amount of money that was spent on three prisoners in McGabbery, £482,000, um, not counting the £350,000 annual running costs for just three prisoners. Uh, and I think we as a committee deserved a little bit more information in regards to that, whether or not um, she signed off on it, knew about it, or, or was it something that was solely for the prison service. Uh, I'm concerned about her reactions to what is escalating into a serious issue in regards to um, the policing board uh, and uh, Jerry Kelly's MLA's position on that policing board, uh, because she has got a role uh, within that. Um, she was forced to come to the Assembly to talk about the 15 sex offences which were set, set aside. I'm now finding out that two prisoners have died in custody within 10 days. Uh, and we've had no statement in regards to that. And that's a serious um, issue. And that's on the back of questions I asked about night security guards, uh, sorry, the night custody officers, where they're refusing to tell us if the staffing levels are being held at the right level. I think the whole point that I'm saying, um, Chair, is I, I do not feel that we are getting the level of information that we should be getting. Uh, and that the Minister is proactive in all of these issues that I've sent. And I think she needs to come in front of us so we can ask us some questions in regards to that. Any members, and any other comments to that? Linda? Yeah, um, I think we'd already agreed, obviously, that we're going to ask the Minister to come. I just want to probably go back a wee bit to, to Doug's comment around um, Jerry's position on the policing board. I don't know what has changed since he took up his position on the policing board. So. I don't know what the issue is there. I'm, I'm just I'm being honest and frank and up, up front with you. So I suppose just to say that, but I don't um, I don't argue with the fact that the minister should still respond if you if you if you want to raise that as a as a query and an issue. We have to have an opportunity where the minister can be asked the questions and she can respond on on behalf of her department. I'm just raising that on, on my own behalf. To be fair, but but I agree with you. The minister needs to come and, and respond to whatever. Questions are very that. And if I can, um, and, and Linda, I'm not having a dig at anybody in regards no, no. to that, just so you're absolutely clear on that. But it is escalating into something, and it is a term of words that was used by Jerry Kelly, which many people will, will have found offensive. And uh, the Minister has got a statutory duty um, to, to be able to act to that um, you know, in some form or another. And we just, I just don't think she has acted properly. I, I think a, a, a limp PR in a paper is not the way to do it. I think there should be something greater. Uh, so we have better clarity, better understanding on what we should be doing in order to give confidence um, because before it escalates into something that becomes a snowball. But that's only one of many issues, and I, and I highlighted quite a few issues. But I think one of the big concerns is, is having been asked to chair the COVID enforcement working group, having been asked um, for her to say no and then not attend and not tell us a rationale for that, I think is, is pretty awful. But the nail in the coffin for me is that two prisoners have died in custody and we have not been given anything uh, in regards to that. And I think that is, 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 is truly 
truly awful. Um, I thought that this um, committee would have had something, uh, even if it was a letter to be discussed, um, uh, not live, if, that was, if it was a sensitive issue. So at least we knew, as opposed to getting second-hand information, which I think all of us are getting at this moment in time. Okay, members, well, I'm happy that we're trying to schedule a meeting with Naomi Long. Um, and there's going to be a range of issues that, that people are going to want to, to highlight with her. And certainly we can have those range of issues as some of the areas that to have down as the topics that we need to engage with her on. Um, I think Sinead Bradley maybe was trying to get in, and then Rachel. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to sound dismissive of Doug's point. I had my hand raised before he made it. So it was actually to ask you to go over again. I didn't quite catch what you said there about um, the statutory draft SIs not coming in front of committee. Is that right on the EU withdrawal? Yes, sorry. On the, 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 the previous item was to do with the way, yeah. it's the way in which the Assembly is going to be dealing with these statutory instruments. So there's... There's work to be done on that so that members of the committee can get a, a proper briefing as to how exactly that's going to be handled. So we will come back to that issue. Um, it was just a, there was correspondence that uh, we had received from FM, DFM that all committee chairs had received. Um, but you will get more information on that. Thank okay. you. Um, Rachel? Thanks. I was just following on from um, Doug's point about the prisoners who have died. Um, Obviously, we, we don't have a meeting scheduled with Ronnie, but is, is, can, can we get some more information from the prison service on that particular issue? Because, um, again, I'm hearing it second, third, fourth hand. Social media, it's not the place to get news. Um, and certainly there would be many questions I would have about what has happened. Yeah. Well, there's, we, we have the routine ability to be asking questions around custody's custodies and death and, and so on and from Ronnie. I'm, I'm hearing a distinct issue about ministerial responsibility and accountability that Doug is raising um, and I think the best way to have that is to have the minister in front of us. So there is a, an agreement that we are going to have the minister we need to identify uh, sooner rather than later when we can do that but we will um, and I'll seek to, to do that and as soon as that's arranged we'll invite members to submit a range of issues that they want to discuss with her and, and we can take it you're happy with that approach? Uh, uh, no, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, uh, it's just a very quick point. Uh, and again, I accept the, the issue around the Minister, but I would say in fairness to um, Ronnie and others, if you wanted to speak to him, he would be happy to speak to you at any time. And that's what I found when I needed to ask any questions. That is certainly the approach that I've found works. And I think that other committee members should, you shouldn't be waiting until Ronnie's in front of the committee because it's an open door. Chair, sure, if I can, I, I speak to him on Tuesday. I've already organised to meet him on Tuesday. I, I, I don't think that's the issue. That's no, not, you're right. I, I, this is not an issue with the prison service. This is an issue with, with the Minister's responsibility and our ability to scrutinise. And I've watched us over this last few years. We've been, as a committee, we've been fantastic in scrutinising. But you can't scrutinise if you don't know. Uh, and I don't think we've been getting the, 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 the full picture, um, you know, uh, to be honest. Well... Like I'm not convinced the minister was going to make a statement. I'll take it at face value when she said she'd already discussed it with the officials when it came to the statement on Monday. But mm. knowing about this in June and then reacting after the committee had raised it, I think spoke volumes. Paul. Yeah. And then we're going to just on a general point. You'll know my and my demeanour on all of this. Uh, I I have, I'm on I'm chair deputy chair of the finance committee and I'm also on this committee. I have not seen. A systemic change in the attitudes of departments and how they treat committees. I must say that the finance is probably worse than this one, but there are still lapses whereby we do not get the information that we require to do our job properly. And the problem with a scrutiny committee is always going to be uh, it's what we don't know, we don't know. So that's an issue for me, always has been an issue for me. I just do not see a culture change for good we have come back so it's the same old same old and that's just not good enough and if there's any member any member of this committee the, notwithstanding political parties or anything because that's not the place here we have done a very good job we're, we're a very good team we're gelling very well we have a very good back staff so we are here to do a job let us do our job and stop this prevarication 
Um, I have massive issues, not least what we talked about earlier with regards to information policies. Information policies in all the departments. What is that? And where's the protocols and where's the standard operating procedures that's used on a daily basis? Because I think sometimes they make it up as they go along. So I have a massive issue there with regards to information flow. Okay. Okay, members. Um, next meeting is today, week two o'clock, and it'll be in this room again. Um, meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.